Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Egypt rises against military rule on the Friday for self-determination. Sudan declares liberation of Heglige as Juba pulls out. And Bahraini activists demand a stop to bloody Formula One. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East begins now. Today, central Cairo's Tahrir Square was the stage for another million-person march. It was called for by many political leaders under the banner, the Friday for Self-Determination, to demand the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces hand over power at the scheduled date in late June. Under the banner of self-determination, tens of thousands of Egyptians gathered in Tahrir Square in the center of Cairo to demand the protection of the revolution that toppled President Hosni Mubarak over a year ago. This Friday's protest also demanded the transfer of power and the unification of all political and revolutionary factions. Activists called for the protest today to demand that those who worked with the former president be prevented from running in the presidential elections, the first round of which will be held next month. However, the Islamists joined the demonstration under the banner protecting the revolution. And as an indication that protesters are intent on pushing the ruling military Military Council to fulfill the promise of transferring power to an elected president. The stage set up by the Muslim Brotherhood in the square included a banner that read, Power Transfer on June 30th. In addition, the Brotherhood-dominated parliament issued a legal amendment known as the Political Isolation Law that prevents senior-level Mubarak officials from running in the presidential elections. The law applies to Mubarak's last prime minister, Ahmed Shafiq, who is one of the 13 presidential candidates. The military council referred the amendment to the Supreme Constitutional Court. If the court decides the amendment is constitutional, elections could be held on May 23rd. As for the stages set up in Tahrir Square, they represented different political affiliations and, for this reason, conflicting messages were seen in the square. But they were unified in the need to get rid of the former era. Before this million-person protest, presidential candidates barred from running strongly criticized the military council and the electoral committee. al Shatter considered the decision to disqualify him an indication that remnants of the former regime are still in power and are attempting to reproduce the regime of deposed president Hosni Mubarak, even if it's an improved version of that regime. The head of the Iraqi government, Nouri al-Maliki, said Turkey is becoming a hostile state in the region. His statement came in response to his Turkish counterpart, Recep Tayyip Erdogan's accusation that al-Maliki is stirring sectarian tension between the Shiites, Sunnis and Kurds in Iraq through his behavior towards his coalition partners. Iraq's al-Qaeda branch, known as the Islamic State of Iraq, claimed responsibility for the bloody attacks that rocked seven Iraqi provinces yesterday, killing at least 38 people. The organization's statement was titled, Thursday's Resolve, saying the attacks are a response to the crimes of the Iraqi government. It was signed by what was called the Islamic State of Iraq's Information Ministry. The Sudanese defense minister has announced that Heglige was liberated from the grips of Juba's army, confirming the region was recaptured by force 10 days after South Sudan seized control of the area. This announcement was intended to refute a South Sudanese army statement claiming that its forces voluntarily withdrew from Heglige. Meanwhile, demonstrations broke out in a number of northern cities to celebrate the North's victory in the battle. President Omar al-Bashir stressed the victory marks the beginning of a war to liberate the South from the rule of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement. Sami al Shanawi reports from Khartoum. Heglish has returned to the arms of Sudan once again. The first battles took place at 2.30 in the morning. Special forces infiltrated the enemy's locations, then besieged and completely crushed it. Khartoum said the plan to liberate the south begins in Heglish and denied Juba's claim that it withdrew from the region. Khartoum's statement declared that it taught South Sudan a brutal war lesson. For the north, the objective of this war is not limited to liberating Heglish, especially after breaking talks with its old enemy, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement.
Khartoum. In the north, spontaneous demonstrations broke out in Khartoum and other northern cities, praising the army's victory and the recapture of Heglish. This scene restored the ruling party's self-confidence. I salute all Sudanese people for their victory and for recapturing Heglish, which is part of our territory. They wanted to seize control of the oil, but I tell them, no way, no way. We will continue our march to Juba. Yes, to Juba. We support you, Mr. President. We're behind you. So Juba did something good for Khartoum by restoring its unity, said Sudan's ruling party that has searched for means to unify its ranks for a long time. But victory does not always lead to success, especially when an entire nation is at stake. In the recovered land of Heglige, sources say the final battle killed thousands of southerners, many of them in an ambush set up by Khartoum's army days after cutting supplies to Juba's army. The Sudanese army stresses the end of the Heglige battle does not mean the end of the war. Khartoum said the objective of the war is to remove the Sudan People's Liberation Movement from South Sudan's government. Samir Shinawi, Dubai TV, Al Khartoum. Bahrain's February 14th coalition called for holding demonstrations on the streets that led to the racing circuit under the banner of the People's Days of Rage in rejection to the blood races. Bahraini opposition societies also called for massive demonstrations titled Resistance and Confrontation west of the capital and Manama. Revolutionaries set off pillars of black smoke around the Bahrain International Airport on the island of Al-Muharraq, and the smoke could be seen covering the airport's runway. Meanwhile, separate demonstrations were held in different parts of Bahrain in protest of holding the Formula One race. The regime insists on holding the race to give the impression that it is stable. <laughs> This comes as the Bahraini opposition calls for organizing massive marches on the Friday of the People's Days of Rage in the center of Al Manema under the banner of No to Bloody Formula. On the other hand, the Bahraini regime escalated its crackdown using bullets on unarmed civilians and kidnapping tens of citizens. <laughs> With these slogans, Bahraini residents took to the streets to express their rejection to holding the Formula One race and demand freedom for the prisoners, especially Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja, who has been on a hunger strike for over two months. It is absolutely impossible for the people to relinquish their fight for ending their imprisonment and slavery with the goal of attaining their rights, pride, freedom, and respect for their will. No one, no circumstances, no object, no terror can force the people to retreat from fulfilling their objective. Not today, not tomorrow. The chants here in Al Manama call for toppling the regime and holding the officials, most notably King Hamad bin Isa al Khalifa, accountable for killing protesters. The residents of Barbar called for the release of prisoner Hassan Mushema, who is being tortured by regime forces despite being sick. Protesters in Sitra Island cried out for stopping the Formula One race. This chant sums up what residents in Karzakan called for in the demonstration that roamed the streets of the city. They raised Bahraini flags and denounced the Saudi occupation of their country. With bullets and fire, regime forces stormed the demonstrations and attacked unarmed protesters, which led to the injury of tens of protesters who were hit with live bullets, according to these images that show several people severely wounded. Here, U.S. produced poisonous tear gas and other forms of suppression were used to crack down on the protesters. Over there, these forces are chasing protesters and arresting dozens of them. 
But here is another scene in a dark, closed room where regime forces are seen severely torturing and beating protesters, according to videos posted online. Israel today marked Holocaust Remembrance Day. The National Memorial Day commemorates the six million Jews who perished during the Nazi genocide of World War II and honors resistance efforts against the Third Reich. IBA's Aaron Viner brings us more on Yom HaShoah in this report. The nation came to a standstill this morning at 10 a.m. as sirens sounded throughout the country for two minutes. Cars stopped mid-road as drivers exited their vehicles and pedestrians stopped in their tracks to stand in silent tribute to the victims of the Holocaust. At the same hour, memorial services were held nationwide. President Shimon Peres and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu laid wreaths by a monument at the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial Museum that depicts Jewish resistance against the Nazis during the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. At a later ceremony in the Knesset, Holocaust survivors, accompanied by their grandchildren, lighted memorial candles alongside MK's Vulun Orlev, Zev Bielski, and Ruhama Avraham. Israeli leaders then recited the names of their own family members who were killed during the Holocaust, beginning with Knesset Speaker Reuven Rivlin. President Perez remembered his relatives who died in his native Poland and described how Nazis dragged Jews out of his village into a wooden synagogue where they were burned alive. At last night's state commemoration of the Shoah at Yad Vashem, the national flag was lowered to half-mast as survivors of the war lighted six torches symbolizing the six million lost Jewish souls. Prime Minister Netanyahu said that now is then there are those who want to exterminate millions of Jews and that anyone who dismisses the threat from Iran has learned nothing from the Holocaust saying that the Nazi dictator's crematoriums created a global disaster and a holocaust for the Jewish people. Paris told those gathered that holocaust deniers are denying the actions of their predecessors to cover up of their own actions and that the lie of denial will not extinguish the fire of the inferno. Both Ashkenazi chief rabbi Yona Metzger and Sephardi chief rabbi Shlomo Amar offered prayers during the service. An IDF honor guard maintained a presence throughout the ceremony alongside a banner in Hebrew reading, remembering the past and promising the future. IDF chief of staff Lieutenant General Benny Gantz said that now, 70 years later, as he stands in the land of Israel and sees the embodiment of the strength of the Jewish nation, the IDF draws its strength from the determination of Holocaust survivors. Gantz said that the army is the arm of steel that will respond to any attempt to hurt us and that never again shall the Jewish people stand defenseless. This is Aaron Viner for IBA News. Just after the siren blared this morning, reporter Aaron Viner asked passers-by for their reflections on Holocaust Memorial Day. Commemorating the Holocaust here in Israel is an annual observance that continues to evoke very powerful feelings among the public. I think about how um, important memories and how important it is that everybody stops for one moment uh, to remember something that happened to the Jewish people uh, for the sake of the Jewish people and for humanity. I find it hard to put into words because it's so horrendous what happened and I see Israel's struggle because I do a bit of reading and I, I see that Israel has a struggle with the whole world and I unfortunately see that there's a very tough times coming up because there's going to be military. There is going to have to be a war. There has to be a war because man, unfortunately, doesn't seem to learn from his lessons from the past. Syria's local coordination committee said 40 civilians were killed today in many Syrian cities. Meanwhile, Syrian state media Sana said 10 regime soldiers were killed in a bomb explosion in Al Qunaitra. Local coordination committee said a child was killed in Aleppo by the gunfire of security forces. This Friday, witnessed demonstrations in a number of Syrian regions as shelling continued to target the neighborhoods of homes and the city of Al Qusir.
Yet another Friday in Syria. This time it was titled, We Will Triumph and Assad Will Be Defeated. Here in the town of Has in Idlib province, protesters chanted slogans and raised banners after the observers began touring the areas and documenting the facts. Most notable was a banner written in English. The village of Binish also took part in the demonstrations. Protests were held in Aleppo, El Hasaka, El Bukamal, and the countryside of Damascus. Meanwhile, security deployment prevented demonstrations in the cities of Dara and Dirazur, as well as the areas of Keswa, Al Qadam, and Al Derzi in the countryside of Damascus. In the village of Zabur in Jabal of Zawiya, residents held massive demonstrations at the same time as Friday prayers. In Duma, in the countryside of Damascus, night protests erupted to condemn the ongoing military operations and demand freedom and change. A massive protest also took place in Al-Kamishli, where residents are mostly Kurdish. The military operations continued despite the presence of UN observers, international pressure, and a rising death toll. Syrian regime forces continued to bombard areas in the city of Homs and its countryside, according to activists in the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. This morning, Syrian forces renewed the shelling of the neighborhoods of Al Khaladiya and Jurat al Shaya before expanding shelling to the neighborhoods of the old city of Homs. According to the Syrian Revolution's General Commission, the city of Al-Qusir near the eastern border with Lebanon was also shelled. As for defectors, Colonel Arkan Abdulaziz Kanan announced in Al Hawla town of Homs the formation of a military council for the coastal areas in Latakia and Tartus under the command of the Free Syrian Army. I declare the formation of the military council for the coastal area that includes the provinces of Latakia and Tartus. Assam Abdullah. Assam Abdullah, BBC. On the political front, Russia called on UN Security Council to quickly issue another resolution on the mission of the international observers in Syria. During a press conference held on Friday in Moscow following a meeting between Russian and Italian foreign and defense ministers, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that everyone should focus on the Anand plan and the UN Security Council's resolution resolution that approved the plan. He added all efforts must be exerted to adopt another resolution to approve sending a full observer's mission to Syria. The minister confirmed his country believes it is necessary to pressure all those who carry arms in Syria. Well, on to Jordan where fresh rallies have been held to demand reforms in the country. The protests were held in several cities, including the capital, Amman. Demanding freedom and justice, the demonstrators condemned corruption, which they said is hindering political and economic change. They also rejected the recent amendments to the electoral law, calling on the people to push for their demands. Jordan has been the scene of pro-reform rallies since early of last year. The protests have continued and have even escalated, despite a number of political changes introduced by the ruling monarch. People in Yemen have taken to the streets across the country demanding the removal of the former regime's remnants. The protesters demanded the trial of ex-ruler Ali Abdullah Saleh and his inner circle. They rallied in the capital Sana as well as Taez, Al Dalia, Rada, and Ib. Anti-government protests continue in Yemen despite Saleh's resignation. The protesters want the ex-dictator to stand trial for ordering the killing of large number of protesters since the start of the revolution. They also criticized the new administration as a fabrication of foreign powers, including Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Saleh gave up power to his vice president in February after receiving immunity from prosecution. The deal was brokered by the Persian Gulf Cooperation Council. 
In Tunisia, the owner of television channel Nesma TV has gone to court for the third time in six months for airing a controversial cartoon. The channel has been accused of encouraging a wave of attacks on Islam in the country. More on that from Tunis. Hearings resumed in what has become known as Persepolis in the trial of Nisma TV in Tunis. The controversial case dates back to October when the private TV channel aired Iranian movie Persepolis, dubbed in Tunisian dialect. A group of 140 lawyers filed a lawsuit against Nabil Qarwi, the owner of the TV channel, and accused him of violating sacred values and disturbing public order. The historical trial of the owner of Nisma TV has divided the Tunisian public opinion between those who think airing Persepolis is a form of freedom of expression and those who believe it's an attack on Islam in Tunisia. Dissuasion is necessary because we are in a Muslim country. The first reaction of the TV owner was to ask for forgiveness. Then he changed his mind and talked about freedoms. People have understood that the movie personified and mocked God while our religion is sacred. A considerable portion of the Tunisian public is confused because they don't understand the TV channel's so-called perception of freedoms. They are calling for the criminalization of the attack on Islam. Is this what they call democracy? They have to be held accountable for their deeds. They want to impose their so-called liberty on our religion. Some attendees have explained that respecting sacred values is one of the pillars of the freedom of expression. This is a Muslim state, and I call on the TV owner to correct his mistake and to repent to God because he's attacking Islam in the name of freedom. The Iranian film Persepolis and the trial of Nisma TV have suddenly brought to the fore contrasting visions of the new Tunisia one that believes in the unlimited character of freedom of expression and another vision that considers the cartoon depiction of God an unforgivable mistake in the name of freedom of expression. Adnan Shawashi, Press TV, Tunis. Who are the hackers that attacked Lebanon's government websites? And why were they able to hack them? The answer in the following report by my colleague, Rami Al-Amin. But the truth is, there is something terribly wrong with this country. We are angry. The attitude of the Lebanese government and the financial elite strictly opposes the values and principles we uphold. The government must exist to serve the will of the people. In clear emulation of the character V from the movie V for Vendetta, a group of hackers addresses the Lebanese state, sending it a severe message. We have been watching recent events with great agony and rage as they surpass our patience levels. The video YouTube we stumbled onto the video that was uploaded on YouTube on March 3rd while looking for clues that would lead us to a group of hackers that attacked Lebanese government websites. The group goes by Raise Your Voice. We sent the group a message through Facebook. They responded by asking us to send our questions to this email address, which we did, but we did not receive satisfying answers. So we inquired again. The group responded that it will issue a statement soon disclosing its goals and beliefs. But who is a hacker usually? Those people are usually good technicians. Their background is in programming and they're very familiar with how websites work, so they know their points of vulnerability. And this is what happened here. They didn't try to attack one site, but went after several sites to detect the issues they have. So they know the vulnerability of all these websites. Not all these sites have been fully restored. Most removed the message the hackers left on their main page, but they are still in tatters. Even the homepage of the President of the Republic still has some problems. Most government websites lack required protection and technical maintenance. The reason is a lack of experience. Join us as we combat the corrupt governmental institutions and its military industrial complex. Up Lebanon, engage. 
جدير ذكره أن مجموعة القراصنة اللبنانيين It is worth mentioning that a majority of this group of Lebanese hackers is affiliated with the international group Anonymous, whose members are unidentified. However, Lebanese security institutions, specifically the branch that fights online crimes, are looking for these hackers to hold them accountable. Many Lebanese are hoping the state won't succeed. بالنسبة إلى البعض تنطبع صورة القرصان في الأذهان على هذا الشكل. A pirate evokes this picture in the minds of some, but the faces of the pirates we are discussing resemble ours. They are intelligent people who sit behind their computer screens. For the state and law, they are criminals, but for most Lebanese, they are heroes. Rami Alamin, New TV. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.